Greetings from the Secretariat of the Asian Productivity Organization in Tokyo, and welcome to the uh, another session of the Productivity Talk. And today we are very privileged that we have a renowned speaker in the field of education, and we are talking about the future of education. And our speaker uh, for this session is Mr. Oli Pekka Heinonen, and he is from Finland. And between Tokyo and Helsinki, we are separated by at least 7,800 kilometers. But thank you so much, Mr. Heinonen, uh, for joining us in this session. And let me have uh, the honor to introduce you, sir. Uh, to our viewers, Mr. Heinonen was actually the former Minister of Education of Finland. He was also the Minister of Transport and Communication, and he also assumed as the State Secretary of the Prime Minister uh, of Jiki Kalenen. And in now he is assuming the position as the Director General of the uh, Finnish National Agency for Education. Thank you again, Mr. Heinonen, for joining us this uh, for this session. And may I first intro, uh, invite you to a little bit elaborate about yourself and begin your presentation on the future of education, please. Secretary General, Dr. Moktan, uh, distinguished participants of the session, thank you very much for having this chance to talk about the future of education, which is central to us. I am leading an agency, Agency for Education in Finland, which is responsible of developing uh, education, lifelong learning and early childhood education in Finland. So it's a nationwide organization and we are also responsible of deciding the core curriculum uh, for all education in Finland. So setting the aims, what everybody in Finland should learn. And for that reason, it's really interesting possibility for me to uh, talk on these issues on this uh, distinguished uh, platform. Talking about the future of education, if we go to the presentation, uh, there is a question that I think the COVID-19 has really kind of waken us up. Uh, if we take the the, the first picture slide, there you can see that like the COVID-19, it showed us that how interconnected and how complex the world today is. That one tiny virus in remote area in China in, in Wuhan city, uh, rapidly changed the life of every human being in the globe. And that means that kind of shows that how everything is connected with everything. And that makes the world very complex. And the more complex the world is, the less we know what will happen next. So, with the education systems and learning, the challenge is that how to educate and train in an uncertain and complex world for a future that we cannot predict beforehand. Going to the next slide, there you can see the kind of developments of the society and the future of work that the 
outer circle shows that we are coming from the in industrial society where human work was connected to the machines in the factories and in that the kind of body the strength and the hands of human beings were the essential ability the skills to use your body effectively after that the next circle is about information society and there we moved from factories to offices and the important issue was the idea that how we can utilize knowledge how we can transfer knowledge utilize it uh, share it um, in different ways and of course in doing that the brain of a human being became the central issue and i think i'm now seeing and we are seeing a development where we are moving from to the next stage and of course the questions of digitalization automatization robotization and the effect of artificial intelligence is affecting that because we are seeing that the artificial intelligence is doing much much more effectively the things that we used to do with our brains so what comes now this essence of a human work i think it comes into interaction because what we as human beings have as a special ability is to work together to reach for shared aims and targets work is problem solving kind of all work in the bottom it's about solving problems and i think that as we humans are good uh, then we, we are good at kind of solving problems but we are also good at creating new problems so i think we will not be out of work in the future but there are enough problems for us to solve but what is essential in solving them is the question that we have to do it together. And if we take the next slide, the slide human labor, there you can see this kind of shame shift connected to the kind of uh, special abilities that we are able, what well, we should be able to tackle so in the industrial society it was the skills in the information society it was the ability to use information and have knowledge and there of course the school subjects that knowledge base was very very important but now when we are moving to the interaction society what becomes important is our ability to cooperate to collaborate to understand each other with social and emotional skills have the creative sense to be able to solve such problems that the artificial intelligence is not capable of doing and also to be adaptive uh, making changes as the environment around us is changing and at the heart of this change there are the questions really that how we can have the agency to act in a complex and uncertain world and there are the basic questions that who am i what is my identity my agency my values my attitudes 
and and cause it's it's becoming more and more important that in the future also knowledge is important skills will be important in the future but then is the question that what you are able to do with the knowledge you have and in that you need the attitudes and the values and all together knowledge skills attitudes and values sum up the future competencies that i will be shortly coming uh, to then there is um, if you take the next slide please uh, there's a fact also that we as human beings we are living longer and we know that in certain Asian countries, for example, Japan, the, the, uh, if the life expectancy rate is going to increase the same way that it has done for about 150 years now, we will see the situation where the majority of the newborns will celebrate their 100th birthday. And that means that when there's a lot of changes in life and in working life it means that we have to have many many jobs and many vocations throughout our um, lifespan and for that reason the ability to learn to learn throughout your life is very very central the next slide please we have traditionally looked at the education system uh, kind of uh, concentrating on the formal learning. And that's, of course, important and it will be important in the future too. But it's not enough. It's actually only a small proportion of all the learning that happens to an individual. And we have to be able to, in a better way, to utilize also the non-formal and the informal learning that happens. Happens in, in working life, in our hobbies, in our everyday life. And we have to be able to utilize that, make it visible and make it as a kind of a human capital to individuals also so that they can utilize it in their activities and that also means that we kind of have to include the adult time uh, as a kind of a growth time in life we know that cognitive growth does not stop when the growth in length stops so actually we have the ability um, cognitively to grow throughout all our lives. And, and, and that is something that actually I think you in Asia understand better than we do, for example, in Europe, because you have valued for a long time the wisdom of older people. But that is something that we in the European um, continent are not so good at doing it. If you take the next slide, there is a way to look at um, kind of two meta tasks of education. The first one is that you kind of transfer all the human achievements that has been made throughout the history to the new generations. All the sciences, all the innovations, all the understanding, and transfer it to the new generation. And then there is another task, and that's the task of giving the young generation the capabilities to confront their future, to build their own future. And when we lived in a kind of a linear developing world, when you took part of the first task, 
you kind of automatically also tackle the second task. But in a complex world, you have to tackle these two tasks separately. So it's not only enough that we kind of transfer the knowledge we have to the new generations, but we have to find better ways to help them to create their own future. And there we come back to the kind of transversal skills. If you go to the next slide, uh, the slide where it's about intended learning versus emergent learning. So the intended learning is actually the kind of learning that is the transfer from generation to generation. That the older people, they know what good looks like and they are teaching it, they are giving it to the learners. But we have to be able to utilize in a better way the emergent learning where we don't know what the good looks like in the future, but we need to give the transversal skills uh, to be able to kind of imagine and create the good in each time context. And I think again, the COVID-19 has been a very good example here because what have it taught us? It has taught us to cope with uncertainty. It has taught us to critical thinking, to try to understand that what is it with this virus? How is it contagious? How long does it stay? Is, will there be an immunity? Things that we didn't know, but we have to kind of try to learn all the time with critical thinking and make also ethical choices in our own lives. And of course, it has, for example, till, uh, taught us how to cope with different ICT skills, kind of computational thinking when we are moved to distance working and distance learning, we have been forced to kind of take into use entirely new skills. And it's exactly this kind of emergent learning that as a whole becomes more and more important. The next slide. Uh, equal teaching is something that we in Finland see that uh, remains very, very important. But what we see is that the diversity of the learners, their background, their needs, their abilities is more diversified than it has been before. And we have to be able to take that, uh, that kind of diversity um, into kind of um, in our actions. Going to the next slide, please. There you can see that when there's a diversity of learning demand, it also requires the diversity of learning supply. We pretty much still look at education as being kind of a factory that the young generations go in from one end of the factory and just on time to apply for the vacancies in job markets come out the educated young people to enter the labor market kind of just in time a way of looking at the education process. I don't think that will be possible in the future. Um, we must stop kind of looking at students as only as kind of job seekers, but understand that they will be in the future job creators, that much, much more they are also creating their own jobs and kind of creating the work around their abilities and constantly developing themselves. And this also means that the idea of kind of mass education, educating everybody with the same content and same issues does not function. 
but actually kind of controversially you can only reach equality by personalizing the education and learning much much more that has been the case so far the next slide please there you can see the how we in finland see the transversal competencies this is actually the basic of our um, primary education um, core curriculum we still have subjects in finland but at the same time the teaching and learning is based on these seven transversal competencies and they are not kind of responsibility of kind of one subject but teachers of all subjects have to take the responsibility of making sure that this kind of competencies are developed in our schools and in the center is really the development of the human being and the development of a responsible uh, citizen in our societies and then to the last picture please i think it's very clear that we have too much kind of fractured our education and learning to different subjects um, and and also to kind of um, kind of we have lost the holistic approach and that's what we should be able to strengthen in the future that to have the school subjects but also have those transversal competencies and also kind of come from the teaching only the individuals to understand the kind of um, shared learning the importance of the shared learning and not only see in education something that is happening in schools but seeing the lifelong learning path that is happening in ubiquitous environments and of course also seeing the human being as a whole not dividing him to cognitive physical mental psychological social historical kind of parts but understanding the entirety of the citizen and increasing his or her agency to solve the problems that we are faced uh, in today's and tomorrow's world and to do it together with other human beings. Thank you so much. Viewers, I think I would like to add, other than the credentials of Mr. Heinonen as the former uh, Minister of Education and as well as the Director General of the Finnish National Agency for Education, I would like to add that why are we discussing the case of Finland? It's because it is also recognized as the best basic education in the world. It is also, uh, among others, the top ranking country in PISA, as mentioned by OECD, the second best performing higher education graduate. So these are actually the reason uh, also why we are featuring Finland as a reference for our uh, discussion uh, today. So, uh, Mr. Heinonen, let me start our discussion by posing a number of perhaps questions that are arising from your presentation. And uh, let me start with uh, what we call future. Yeah? Future here, I think I wish to be a little bit more uh, have uh, to have a parameter rather than just open-ended what is, you know, what is the future. Say, for example, uh, I would like to see the segment until 2030. Uh, so it means those, uh, say, for example, uh, six graders now, when they are 12 and uh, 10 years from now, uh, 
2030, there will be the fresh graduate of a university. I think that is one timeline. Are we, what will be, is, is there going to be an, any significant change within that time frame in one decade? Then perhaps if we push the next future, say 2050, yeah, uh, those same group, for example, will have to be uh, already uh, adding about uh, 30 years, uh, 20 years, they will be already uh, in the senior level uh, in their careers, supposedly. And that will come to what you say, the continuous learning, the life learning. Yeah. Uh, so we have stages. So can you bit, have a little bit more specific, uh, what you call this, uh, analysis on the timeline? say 2030 and 2050. I acknowledge that the, the, the future is, we cannot predict the future, but my position, my view is that we need to be open to it. We need to be ready. May I invite your view on that first, Mr. Hayanonen, please. Yes, thank you. Thank you so much for an excellent question. Um, I, I think first, uh, there, there are, those things that we kind of think that we know. And, and one of those things is the fact that uh, I think it's clear that the kind of uh, division of life into three different phases, uh, that will go broken. That the idea that first you go to school, then you enter the working, uh, the, the, the labor market uh, viewers I think uh, we may have a little bit of uh, connection uh, hi Nunan, uh, can you hear me I can hear you yes yes please continue yeah very good yeah uh, um, and the, the kind of uh, the the question is that that we have to prepare to a kind of a world where um, you study and then you work and you study again and you work maybe in a different field and 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 that will be uh, happening but then there's a challenge that um, kind of thinking about, 2030 or 2050. Um, I think if we're thinking about 2030, uh, I would say that one thing that becomes very, very important is how can we work together with machines? Um, how to utilize the strengths of artificial intelligence and the strengths of human uh, human knowledge and capabilities. How to put those two things together, and 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 that's a very very kind of a special um, kind of um, question that we are now trying to tackle. That what we humans actually are better than the machines, mm. and and what what's the essence of that, um, and. I would say that there are a few issues that come important. One is the question of making ethically sustainable decision in each context. Mm. Um, uh, and that is something that remains our task. So I think that to kind of understand what is kind of good at each time uh, is a central ability for us humans. Another thing is that, uh, if, and then if we look at the time to 2050, um, there are so many things that are kind of impossible for us to imagine. And mm. then there's the question that actually <laughs> imagination becomes important. Uh, imagine a future we want and to be able 
to move to that direction. So the, the imaginative ability, that kind of creativeness of human beings, I think in the long run comes more and more important. Because we know as a fact that people that are creative are better coping with uncertain situations. They have a better skill to kind of survive and, and, and cope with uncertainty. And, and that is something that becomes very, very central in the future. Thank you, Mr. Heinen. And I agree with you. Uh, in a sense, you are talking about uh, also adaptability. Yeah, because then you are talking that the future is uncertain. The future is complex. And yes, I agree also that we cannot predict. Even 2050, it will be very difficult. I think I cannot imagine what I will advise uh, to the children uh, at this point of time that something yet that is not really there. What the job is not yet created, the technology is not invented, and uh, the challenges is not all, uh, not defined. And yet, there is some common issues uh, in, in, in the global concerns, global responsibility that will need to continue. That the next generation and generation after that will to, to have to tackle. And that is, for example, the global warming. So as you said, the skills, the attitude, the uh, knowledge and the values and the adaptability will be very, very important. Uh, I would have actually uh, some uh, more uh, questions, but let me also, uh, Mr. Heinonen, we have received a number of questions from the viewers. So uh, allow me to take one to start with from a uh, long time friend, Mr. Prabha Nair in Singapore. Uh, Prabha, thank you so much for listening. And then uh, also the question from Prabha is that uh, to Mr. Heinen, and can you share your insights how to prepare the young people for jobs in the future? Mm. Yes, that's... Uh... That's a very challenging, challenging uh, question, um, and and as I said, it, it's it's kind of challenging to prepare for the jobs that you don't know what those jobs will be, and and we also know that the jobs that you can describe the tasks in an easy way are the ones that are most easy to be programmed and by that also replaced by artificial intelligence. So I would say that that kind of gives us the understanding that really the future jobs will be such where the kind of task description is not kind of very easy uh, to do. And, and again, I would say that what is vital is the abilities to work with other people, to, uh, to kind of collaborate, to cooperate, to set shared targets and work together towards those targets and also to feel kind of empathy to other people, understanding what other people are feeling um, in order to be able to work in a trustful uh, environment together. The other one is what we just talked about, and, and that's, the, that's the kind of uh, the, the, the creativity issue, the, the, the ability to uh, to kind of uh, make such things that are not there today. And the third one I would like to take up is the ability for metacognition, 
the ability to think about your own thinking and to develop it through that kind of a process all the time. So it's a kind of a internal learning loop that that we should be able to utilize in a better way. And 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 that is something that uh, that that is is very kind of central for doing better, making development as a whole, as individuals, as kind of uh, working organizations, but also as kind of nations and as a species. Thank you, uh, Mr. Heinonen. Let me uh, continue on that topic. You have mentioned uh, it in, in uh, several places about creativity. Now we 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 agree that is what will be important. But then the next question is how. Yeah, and this is the question from Ms. Naoko Tanaka from Japan. And the question is that creativity has been emphasized always. How can we make sure students stay creative through education? Hmm. Yes, that goes to the very, very heart of education systems. And, and uh, I, I must say that also in Finland, uh, the, the education system historically was not kind of built to, to kind of increase uh, creativity. Um, I think what, what is important is the, uh, the ability for critical thinking that there is not the idea that there is right answers to everything, but it's the question which is important is the the things that you don't know and your ability to kind of value different knowledge bases, different disciplines, uh, uh, kind of those perspective in a holistic matter. Ma matter. Uh, and also, uh, and, and that's of course something that uh, the it's the uh, Dr. Tverk's model where he kind of have, has two mindsets. It's the fixed mindset or the growth mindset. And the fixed mindset is the one where kind of feedback is also seen as something as negative. New challenges are something that they are threat cause you can fail. And the growth mindset is where feedback is always the possibility for learning. And also challenges are possibilities of finding something new. And this kind of a growth mindset, kind of in a way, a bit of a positive psychology idea is very, very important for creativity also. We in Finland, we... Uh, have a quite strong uh, kind of role in our core curriculum for also uh, the arts like music or, or other kind of culture, play um, and, and, and that kind of subject. And uh, of course, they are good ways of, of also increasing creativeness. And actually, I think in the in the heart of the question is also the question that how, for example, the school community is functioning. That is it as a community, a, a place, something that as an environment uh, is increasing creativity. And, and then it's the kind of open mindedness that, that should be the, the value that, that kind of should be uh, nourished in the, in the school environments in order to, to kind of strengthen the, the, the creativity skills. Thank you, uh, Mr. Heinonen. And I'm glad that you mentioned about art. Yeah. Uh, uh, and, and that is also will be uh, important in as a source of creativity and open-mindedness 
but uh, let me push it further a little bit and how are we doing at this point of time whether we are doing sufficient or not because uh, there, i have two questions here uh, mr heinen one is from mr nathan walker uh, from the us the question is nowadays children are so busy learning coding programming at a very early age is this really okay connected with that is that a, a question from andhra pradesh uh, india and the question is many people underscore the importance of math coding science and technology for the future we can lose a sense of humanity by over emphasizing function uh, could you share your insights with us on this mr heinen please yes thank you thank you very very good questions uh, uh, I, I would say that again come back to the kind of holistic approach that if we are too strongly concentrating on the on the math and science side and on the technology and the, on the coding uh, the the outcome will not be good but we have to be able to combine that kind of abilities which will be important also in the future with the more human humanistic approach also including the arts part and and if you can combine those two things then you are creating something really really valuable and 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 that's the the issue also with with the kind of new technology that there's a lot of young people who spend all their time with with kind of technology uh, and and i don't think that's a good thing mm. i think uh, also the kind of time in a child's and young people's life should consist of different activities you the course finding the balance there is is very very important um it's it, it's the the uh the studying it's the kind of computers but it's also the physical activities and it's also the kind of leisure time that should be taken care of and that's one of the reasons actually why we in finland uh, we spend less time in school than students in other countries uh, so, uh, and, and still in kind of, for example, PISA comparisons, our learning outcomes are good. And, and we don't have very much homework in Finland either. Because we want to make sure that the children are also having something else in their lives. That they have the time to play, be with their friends, with their family and grow in doing that and and that's the kind of growing and and supporting the growth as a human being thank you uh mr heinen and i wish i have studied in finland not having so much homework i was struggling with that i continue to to struggle even now with homework but i take note on your uh, point uh, for this holistic and finding a balance I think this is very important. What we are talking, actually, we are we are making a well-rounded human development here, yeah. And and that is actually why uh, what is uh, Finland is doing, and also uh, how it is now becoming the uh, best basic education in the world. Let me continue, uh, uh, Mr. Heinonen, and this is. Uh, you know, a question from Mr. or Ms. Adia Limarto from Indonesia. And this relates to the uh, future education. And he picked uh, a, a number of uh, keywords, open to all, ultra personalized, peer to peer online as the keywords for future education. And the question is whether education will be more decentralized and more democratized in the future. Hmm. 
Yes, uh, again, a very, very good question. Um, I, I think that uh, we should see education systems not only actually as education system, but as learning systems. And, and also the other word, the system, is important. Because what is a system? It, it's, uh, it's an entirety where the parts of that entirety are strongly interdependent of each other. And that is really what an education and learning system is all about. That there is that interdependency between the learner, the teacher, the school, the school principal, the education provider on the local level, the growth community of a child, and of, of course also the national, the regional and national decision making. And I see that we should be able to create a kind of a see this learning system as a as a human learning system meaning that it is that there's a learning loop a develop developmental loop in that system where the best possible solutions are co-created in that system so, and we should rely on the professionalism of the teachers and school principals and other personnel. We should trust them. And we should then kind of, on the national level, set the general core goals for learning and how it is done should be much, much more on the responsibility of the local level and of the teachers. And that also requires that the trust is an in, a very, very central issue in this kind of a system. And trust is not kind of, it, it's not there automatically, but it comes actually through interaction. So there must be enough interaction between all the different actors in the system. And there is the question of kind of, uh, the, the trust this comes out of reliability, credibility and intimacy in the system. Intimacy meaning that, for example, the national level and the school level, they are living the same reality. They understand that what is important in the context of learning. And, and in that sense, uh, they, they, they kind of, uh, kind of um, more decentralized way, kind of globally thought, I think is the direction where we are going towards. And also, again, with COVID-19, we have seen that how important the role of parents is in learning with the distance learning mode. Uh, it kind of put that in the, in the spotlight. And in that sense, I think where things went fine with the distance learning mode, where the time where before the crisis, there was a good communication between schools and parents. If that was there before the crisis, everything went fine through the crisis. But if that wasn't there, then there were some kind of friction and problems uh, uh, happening. So in that sense, I, I would say that it, it should be, education is a, is a central kind of uh, tool and mechanism of democracy and in that sense it should be a of course also as such um, a democrat democratized um, activity thank you uh, mr heinen and i pick one of your uh, keywords uh, on what you have just mentioned and that is the professionalism of the uh, of the teachers of the educators, 
and that is one that we need to trust we need to believe that and but the other one is also there are the values in the society uh and and that is this question from our friend in fiji and this actually uh uh kasturi nair in fiji uh, raising the question more often than not making mistakes is considered to be bad then how can we change the social culture where mistakes are considered bad through education yeah so this is actually on 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 one hand we have we need to trust the professionalism mm -hmm. yeah but on the other there are values in the society that are norms that are expectation and and how do we jive with this situation mr heinonen mm -hmm. yes thank you um uh, I will kind of answer this question by concentrating on the role of a teacher. Um, uh, and it's, it's then the question that what's the identity of a teacher? That is the teacher an authority who has the right answers and then kind of gives those right answers to the pupils, teaches them to the pupils. And that kind of an approach it kind of emphasizes that there are right answers the other alternative is that the teacher is concentrating on kind of deciding and and designing the learning path of a pupil and kind of th through kind of continuous uh, evaluation and kind of communication between the, the teacher and the pupil, uh, you start to create the pupil's ability for self-assessment and kind of l creating through that also the kind of learning to learn abilities. and through that uh, actually then the mistakes become as a possibility they, they are not something that are kind of harming anybody but they are a way to go forward and so so i would say that the the identity of a teacher in this sense is a very very central central one uh, and 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 of course there there is the question that that how, how how does the society as a whole value what kind of values uh as you dr mock that were saying that 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 has a strong effect that also the teacher's identity is quite often strongly bound to the society's values uh so it's a it's a much much more larger larger issue that only the teacher identity. Uh, and thank you, Mr. Heinen. And, and relating back to the teachers, we, we, we give the, what you call is the, the stage and prominence and the central role to the teachers. And uh, in, this, uh, in this regard, a question from uh, Emily Wana in Australia. Thank you, Emily, for writing. Uh, can you share? what Finland has done in equipping schools or teachers with tools to ensure these skills like creativity, collaboration are encouraged in the classroom? Uh, yes, uh, it's, uh, we have a Finland, in, in Finland, we have a very kind of a, uh, a, 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 a kind of a positive positive problem in that sense that it's quite difficult actually in Finland to become to study to be a teacher. So it's in, in some Finnish universities, one out of 10 applicants to study to be a teacher get in. So, so it's a very popular profession. And that mm. means that we can kind of, in a way, choose the best suitable um, students to become teachers. 
And uh, we are not only choosing those uh, students by their grades from school, but we are also kind of looking at what other activities, what other hobbies they have had in their lives. And they're also, for example, musical or other artistic hobbies are valued. So we want to have as teachers, uh, how would I say, kind of very holistically balanced uh, personalities and individuals to be able exactly to, to kind of also um, to, to encourage um, the, 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 uh, the, the creativity um, in, 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 uh, in schools and, and with their pupils. And of course, the other thing we have done is what I said that, that we have in Finland on the core curriculum, uh, the, the art subjects have, have a, they have a strong role there. And, and, and there's quite a lot of um, hours also reserved for, for, for those activities. Um, so I would say that in, in, in that sense, um, kind of, uh, we've tried to do a lot in, 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 in that sense. One thing that I would still like to also emphasize of the Finnish system, which we don't often understand ourselves, but, uh, we have 15 minute breaks uh, through being classes. And what is happening uh, outside during those breaks is very, very important because we try to encourage the play of children during those breaks, that they have different kinds of physical and other activities uh, that they want to use their time between classes. And that's actually um, quite a significant issue also. Thank you, Mr. Heinonen. And in that, actually, you refer to perhaps, I would, uh, as you mentioned earlier in the, your presentation, about formal education. Mm -hmm. uh, and earlier, you mentioned that we need also to take into account the formal, the non-formal, and also the informal uh, uh, part of education. And yes, in some society, the formal, the structured one is actually still very strong. You have to go, they wish the children to go to this uh, elementary school A, then continue to the high, uh, junior high school B, and then the high school C, and say in the case of Japan, the ultimate one is Tokyo University. That is the past, that is actually the standard, the very, very structured formal education. But here are the questions, two are two questions, and perhaps you relate it to non-formal and informal uh, education, Mr. Heinonen. One is from Iran. Uh, our viewer from Iran, Shahriar Rahmani. And the question is, how is home-based learning in Finland and to what extent official education system supported? And relating to this, there's a question from Malaysia, Datu Lok, and uh, will working from home and home education be the future way forward to improve quality of workforce? Uh, so the emphasis is on the home-based learning. Uh, yes. We are, I've talked about the formal, the structured one. Yes, I agree. They're still there. It's still pervasive. But now we are talking, we are moving, shifting into this non-formal, informal, perhaps even home-based learning. What is your experience? What is your view? What is your insight, Mr. Heinonen? Mm -hmm. Yes. Uh, well, in, in, in Finland, we see that we see that education is, is not only as a kind of a service, but it is a, actually also a place. And, 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 and our, our system is based on, 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 on primary education, especially on, on 
the fact that all school all uh, children go to school and uh, that is also something that that it's part of the how we see equality so important in the education policy that uh, that is the best way to guarantee from the child's point of view that they have equal opportunities uh, for the future and um, that is also something that uh, how would i say um, it is in the essence of the finnish education system we like home education there is not very many pupil and students who are studying that way it's possible in finland parents can make the that kind of uh, choice that they are teaching their uh, children at home but then there is that responsibility that they are also responsible of achieving the the uh, the aims of the national core curriculum and and there aren't very many uh, parents who are um, kind of uh, willing to to commit to that cause they trust the teachers and they trust the education system uh, what what i think becomes more important is the other activities the hobbies and all that outside school time also and then there's the question that how we can uh, make visible the skills and abilities that young people for example have created through that kind of activities and to be something that they could also utilize in the working life so it's uh, it's not only kind of the official uh, grades and diplomas that matter but it's also making that kind of other activities and what's been able to create there to value Thank you, uh, Mr. Heinenen. I am still having a number of questions from the viewers. I, although uh, we have set it for one hour, but can we continue just a little bit more and 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 for the benefit of our uh, from various places from viewers? And I think it will be important uh, also uh, to 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 have your views to uh, so then the uh, in our part in Asia we can also learn. And uh, one question is actually from Malaysia, Abigail. And her question is that in some Asian countries, uh, they focus on memorizing knowledge. Yeah. And how can we improve the educational methodology? Uh, of course, we memorize knowledge basically before the exam. Oh, I was good at it one day before and during the exam. The next day I forgot. Yeah, already. So how do we improve on this, Mr. Heinenen? Um, well, w we have one solution to that in Finland, and that's the fact that uh, we, we don't really, uh, how would I say, we don't put very strong emphasis on tests. So mm. we, we actually, on, on, on primary education, we don't have any national tests, for example. We have only one national test, and that's at the end of the secondary general education. Um, so, so, and exactly for the for the uh, reason that you were mentioning, that uh, so often we see that to study for the test is to study to forget. <laughs> that, that 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 once you're past it you don't have to keep those things in mind anymore and what we want to happen is to kind of have the deep learning happening so that it becomes part of your understanding your worldview and um, i think knowledge wise if we think for example different subjects like chemistry or history or biology uh, it's important to have the basic kind of concepts behind those subjects 
to know them in that sense. Mm. But what is also very, very important in the future is your ability to think like a physicist or to think like a historian or to think like a, um, a biologist. And that's then a kind of a more active knowing. It's kind of participatory knowing. It's something that you are you have agency in utilizing that knowledge. And I'm afraid that kind of not very often through kind of memorizing knowledge, you end up with that kind of a participatory knowledge. And, and I, I see that, that that is the way to, to kind of uh, uh, ha have such knowledge that could be utilized as human capital. Thank you, Mr. Heinen. And I think that is a very, very uh, interesting and appropriate, uh, you know, having this ability to think deeply, participatory. And I like Finland so much that no homework, no test now. I should have studied that. Yeah. And uh, let me, I have still two more, if you don't mind, Mr. Heinonen. And uh, that uh, we, I have received from uh, Korea, Republic of Korea, Miss Claudia Hyun. This goes back to the uh, education uh, and and future jobs. Yeah, the question is that many jobs will disappear in the future. It means whatever we teach our children now should be relevant to the future jobs. Then the question is, how can we help them better? Hmm. Uh, I think one way to help them better is to help them trust themselves hmm. uh, and help them to have such a kind of a healthy self-esteem that they understand their own value, but they also understand the value of other human beings and that seeing that everybody is valuable doesn't mean that somebody is more valuable than the other but each are valuable in their uniqueness and with that kind of an attitude combined with the issues that we have spoken about the the creativity about the collaboration uh, skills about the metacognition, critical thinking. I think that's a perfect way to enter the future job markets with jobs we do not know today. Thank you very much, Mr. Heinonen. And there's one more question, and this let's let's make this a concluding question, and this is again from our friend Prava in in Singapore. Uh, he asked a question first, and then now the uh, last question from Prava Nair is that: Do you think future of education will move toward self-managed learning? Uh I would say that it's it's kind of a question that that who are we talking about then? I think that there will be uh, a, a a kind of a move move towards self-managed learning on the on the adults side. I think that. Um, when we're talking about young pupils, uh, I don't think they have the learning abilities ready to do that, but they need to help to kind of get their forward in that kind of a path first. So I don't see that change happening with the, with, with the young, young pupils. Uh, but with the adult ones, yes, and actually, I think that what we are seeing also is, for example, if we think about 
organizations, working organizations, I think that so far when we've talked about, for example, HR activities, the, the human resource management, it's been pretty much about recruitment and then some kind of courses organized. But actually, I think that what will become more and more important also in working organizations is uh, to kind of to lead the learning of the whole organization. That, that you cannot, where, where there is a, a kind of a, a shortage of skills, of course, it's there's the possibility that you kind of hire new people. But when the ra change is happening rapidly, you cannot always hire new people for new needs. But you have to be able to develop the whole organization through learning. And that's also part of the kind of how adaptive organizations are, because adaptability is actually about learning. It, it, we're talking about the same thing, how we connect to the environment and how we are able to cope with the changes there and are able to adapt ourselves to those changes so that the balance is better. And that's learning. Thank you so much, Mr. Heinen. And I think we, uh, I need to wrap it up and allow me to give you time and and uh, if any, uh, you know, concluding message that you would like to share with us from this discussion, from the presentation, and uh, we would like to uh, really, uh, you know, treasure your, your advice on this and this will be an insight for everyone, uh, us who, uh, who are here in, in Asia in particular. Mm -hmm. um, yes, thank you. Um, first of all, I must say that I was very thankful for this possibility to, to make this presentation. And I was also, it was very nice to hear those questions of those countries that I have visited myself and, and had through that kind of had a bit of understanding of the education systems. Um, the thing I would like to say is that at the end that, that we have such huge challenges in front of us. The climate change, change the inequalities in our societies, um, the the kind of um, refugee challenges, and those are challenges that nobody and no nation alone can conquer. But we need each other to do that. And then I come to the Einstein saying that we cannot solve the new problems with the same thinking that created them. And to change that thinking, we need education. And for that reason, these challenges are actually, they are a global educational challenge. We have to find together ways to find better educating and learning systems globally in order to, uh, to, to solve those challenges we are faced with. And for that reason, I think this kind of possibilities are so, so important to me. And I think we have to strengthen the international collaboration in these issues. And I truly admire a lot of the work that the Asian countries are doing in these issues. So thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mr. Heinonen, indeed. And let me also uh, put a few concluding remarks from my side. And uh, it will be too rich of a discussion for me to, to extract. But a few, I think, key points is worth uh, emphasizing here. As you mentioned in the beginning, that we education is not only as a factory. I think that we need to also uh, get away from that mindset, uh, uh, from that perspective, and importance of also having creativity, 
holistic, finding a balance. And the question is actually, as you put it in the first place, actually, who am I in a complex, uncertain uh, uh, future and which challenges that is actually not only for, for a, a nation state, but it is a challenge to the uh, uh, global, it is as a challenge to humanity. And the bottom line here, what we are doing is basically developing human being as a citizen. And I hope uh, uh, that everyone, the viewers, also benefit from the presentation of Mr. Heinonen. Thank you very much again. And I would like also thank you, the viewers, for sharing their insights. And uh, let's please continue with the uh, discussion, the, 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 the cooperation, and the APO will continue with this, with this uh, session as well. Thank you very much again, uh, Mr. Heinonen. Thank you very much, everyone. Thank you.